Hi, Lizzie and Damien. Welcome to 10 by 6. Hi there. Hello. Both well? Yes, thank you. Uh, yeah, cooled yes. down a bit, which is nice. Yes, yes, absolutely. We've been out for a nice walk today. We're yeah. following on in our series of interviewing people as to why they make their, the transition from one party to another, or by simply stopping voting for a particular party. Last week, we looked at Conservatives. This week, we're going to look at Labour Party or non-Labour Party voters. So we're just going to focus specifically on the sort of the transitional process from when you when you began to vote Labour and why you did so to the point where you are now, where you're not prepared to vote for Labour and just discussing why. So Damien, if you want to kick us off with, with your rationale as to initially why you started to vote for the Labour Party. Well, um, how old was I? I, did, I, did, I joined the party just after the election that Neil Kinnock lost, and I was devastated that, that Labour had lost. I, I'd read a book called Making Our Way, which was written by Kinnock, and, and I just realised that, that I was a, a Labour Party supporter. Um, I'd never really thought of joining the party before. I don't think you, you do when you're sort of 16, 17. Um, but I, I was at college in London at the time, and I remember I bought uh, a book called Livingston's Labour, which was uh, written by Ken Livingston, and it just blew my mind, you know, having gone through school and university, that what I was reading in that particular book, it, it made me so excited. And, and I really believed, you know, when I was reading that book, that, that my life had changed forever because it was the most exciting thing I'd ever read. And it covered all sorts of topics, women's rights, Ireland. And, and then it got me really interested in foreign policy in particular. So anyway, I joined the Labour Party. I, I was of the opinion at that time that perhaps the Labour Party would never win another election. And then Tony Blair came along and I was a big supporter. And, and looking back, obviously I regret that I, I was sort of fooled by him, but I used to go to Labour conference and have a great time. You know, my life became really exciting then. And, and when you've got you know, your leader who stands up at conference and says, this is the generation that could save all further generations from the scourge of war, you get really excited and you feel like you're a part of it. The fact that he was a liar working with Mandelson to change the party fundamentally from what it was into what it is today. Um, I, did, I also read a book uh, by John Pilger and again that blew my mind and I suddenly realised that Blair was not on my side. He, he was on the side of... Um, weapons manufacturers of of you know trying to control and and tame democracy i mean he could have reformed the house of lords i mean look at the commons today it's an absolute antiquated mess and he was not the radical person that, that he was portrayed as and obviously when he went to to, to meet murdoch i assumed he was just going to use murdoch and get him on board in order to promote labor policies but the, the opposite was true you know he, he used murdoch to basically follow Murdoch's agenda and get good good coverage. So, so anyway, the Iraq war, I was virtually ready to leave the party anyway when the Iraq war um, sort of raised its head. And, and I left uh, the party probably six, uh, five months before uh, the war began and I joined Stop the War. And again, I had a, an amazing time working with Stop the War where you met proper sort of activists who actually knew what was properly going on in the world because you know having joined the Labour Party there were some people in the party who literally knew nothing about how the world works and they probably joined because their parents you know were in the Labour Party mm -hmm. and and that and obviously Tony Blair changed the nature of it and tried to attract people you know from big business and all these walks of life where where Labour Party you know, it's not really there to represent those kinds of people, but because Blair was trying to change the party fundamentally, it, it, it changed. And the MPs we got were parachuted in. So so I think this is where the problem began, really, with, with, with um, you know, the difficulties that Corbyn had. He may have been the leader, and it may have been an accident that, that he became leader, but when you've got the MPs against you, it's virtually impossible really to, to become prime minister, I would say, looking back on it now. So did you, before we move on to you, Lizzie, did you, at the point when you got, became disenchanted with Tony Blair and you joined Stop the War, did you stop voting for Labour? 
it really depended actually sometimes i did vote labor sometimes i simply didn't vote at all um when i wasn't a member i did vote lib dem at some point um i've also voted green um but you know the problem with us living in this area is that it doesn't really matter what you vote my, my vote has never never counted um so you know the the, the way I, I deal with politics I, I don't see my vote as being particularly but particularly useful to me but activism has been and and i I rejoined the party eventually, you know, I, I left before the Iraq war and then I came back simply because of Jeremy Corbyn, because I knew that he was the sort of person who was not a liar and was not going to try and fob you off. And he actually said what he believed. And, and years ago, I, I decided I'm only ever going to become an activist for a cause, which is um, what it is meant to be, you know, what, you know, what it says on the tin. So, so. I came back and the Corbyn experience was brilliant because, you know, we became the biggest political party in Europe. And that got me excited. And the fact that young people wanted to join, if you were a young Lib Dem, you must have been looking at all these enthusiastic young people joining the Labour Party and, and they must have been so tempted to jump ship. And when you see him at Glastonbury, you know, it takes a particular kind of person with principle to be able to get young people excited. And and what did the the... the the people do that Blair brought in, they started calling these young people cult members. And it makes you so sick because in this country, we've been trying to get young people interested in politics. And that is the resp response of these, these sour pusses to just call these young people naive cult members. And it's disgusting that something so positive like having half a million members was, well, you know, it, 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 it how could they deal with something so positive and turn it into a negative? Well, we know now, and, and obviously the whole problem with the Labour Party and why I would never join it again now is because it is so corrupt. The people at the top of the party who control it and discipline people, the leaked Labour report proved what how corrupt it is. And we've got all the evidence we we. we we need now. I mean, as a Corbynite thinking, well, Corbyn's the leader, but this party isn't changing quick enough. And 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 suddenly you, you get to conference and, you know, reform and democratizing the party isn't on the agenda anymore. And and of course, it's because of this corruption. It's what Blair did. He, he got control of the levers of the party. And, and there was a lot of nepotism and jobs for the boys. And, and so this sort of loyalty towards Blair's politics, it stayed with the party. And as soon as a proper opposition leader came along, like Corbyn, somebody who they despised, they had the means to be able to stop this, what seemed like an unstoppable force. And I think it took us by surprise, really, because because I was really enthusiastic that, that nothing could stop us at one point. You know, when you've got that many people joining enthusiastically and getting out for elections, delivering leaflets and on mass and enjoying doing it, you thought, how could anybody stop this? But of course they did. And it's been a, a lesson learned. Thank you. Thank you, Damien. What was the, when was the first year, Lizzie, that you voted Labour? Can you remember? Um, well, I've only ever voted Labour, um, and that is because I never voted, ever. Um, in my professional life, I knew how corrupt government was, just as corrupt as the media was. And so I, I never felt that it represented me. It never, it was just something to put, put blocks in the way of anybody with a socialist ideal in their in their body um so yeah the first time i voted labor or voted at all was for jeremy corbyn right okay so that late that late yeah. right okay so in, in terms of what your sympathies when you, you know you met politicians or you saw them on television or you watch question time or whatever where, where would your did your sympathies lie before Jeremy Corbyn? I, I was a reporter, a journalist, so of course I've met 
all the whole gamut of, of politicians and um, I knew how corrupt they were. I didn't ever meet Jeremy Corbyn um, until he popped up um, on the ballot for uh, leader of the Labour Party. Um, I liked Dead Miliband, thought he was a decent fella who um, who was trying his best. And he, yes, he had an, a, a rather um, entitled background, but simply because of the hard work of his father. And um, I think that he he used that platform that he that he was born to uh, very well in defence of ordinary people. But the, the whole system is corrupt, always has been corrupt. And so for a while, when Jeremy Corbyn became leader of the party, I thought that, uh, like like Damien, that, that we were an unstoppable force because um, it, it was just common sense policies. You know, who doesn't want to save our NHS? Who wants it privatised? Nobody, except, of course, the ones who are going to profit from it. So, uh, you know, um, the, the, the original question that you asked, um, who did I support beforehand? Broadly Labour, I had a lot to do with the Conservatives, um, are very big on their largesse. You know, they, they have a lot pots of money and they have all the power and the control. So they would open up food banks, soup kitchens, donate, devote their time to helping the disabled or the poor. Um, but it was always at their discretion. You know, oh, I'm so good, I do this for my community. So um, that wasn't how I believed that, that this country at least should be run. I believed, and I still believe, that everybody is entitled to to a decent standard of living. Uh, at least, you know, everybody is entitled to free dental health, uh, eye, ear, you know, in, in complete care for free, regardless of how much money you have. I I enjoyed the 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 private the private practices that um, that catered to those with obscene wealth. Um, and if you've got the money, yes, go private and leave the NHS waiting lists for uh, for, for other people who can't afford to pay for their care. Um, and I, I was pretty OK with that, although, you know, but it, it was the um, what happened to me was I fell ill. And um, I, I felt quite seriously ill, burned through my savings, wasn't able to work. And met the world of benefits and my god what a trauma that was a, a complete trauma in and of itself um you know that that was my my illness my my illness was nothing as compared to the world of benefits and i went on tv i went on the radio um i went on the vic derbyshire show I, and i shouted out loud about the the fact that my god i'm going to get better you know i i'm left with conditions yes but i'm going to get i'm not i'm not going to be disabled forever totally so but what about all those people who are never going to get better who who need that care and support and there is none there is none left you know and and you can paper over the cracks as much as you like but and that's what got me going. Um, it was the it was the fact that the NHS was being privatized. I mean, of course, it was being privatized 40 years ago when Thatcher started it off. It was the last remaining public service. The water had gone, the gas and electric had gone, the trains had gone, the buses had gone, everything public service had gone. And only the only thing left was the most profitable and the most the dearest to people's hearts was the NHS. So that's taken them 40, 50 years now, isn't it? Uh, and they're at the final hurdle now. And I don't know how we're going to stop it. I, I don't know if we can stop it. But um, and that was why 
when Jeremy Corbyn came along, it 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 um it just worked out so fantastically in so many ways, which I'll enlarge upon if you're interested in hearing after you've had a your say. Thanks, Lizzie. I mean, Damien, um is, is there anything there that corresponds in terms of your experience, or is there anything there that, in terms of Lizzie's experience that certainly wasn't anything that motivated yourself? I'm, I've always been lucky. I'm a, I'm a single chap, and, and I've always worked in this area. I, I've, I've always taken a break between jobs. Um, I was a civil servant for 13 years, working at the DWP and the DVLA. And I've also worked for Barclays Bank. Um, so, you know, I, I've had a pretty good life, really. And it's it's allowed me time to um, follow my hobbies and interests, which happens to be politics. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm glad to have had that experience, certainly. Um, but I say I, I just keep looking at back at it. It's been a very good learning experience. And it's the sheer corruption of not only the country, but but the Labour Party. And I think it's this corruption which holds us back. And what allows this corruption to flourish is, well, I, I pin 75 percent of the blame on the BBC because there are certain topics which I say I still have my mind blown by some of the content on things like the Jimmy Dore show and the grey zone, for example. America is occupying a third of Syria against all international laws. They're trying to starve the people of Syria into submission illegally because they're, they're, they're actually occupying the sort of breadbasket areas where the food is produced. They're also stealing the oil. And that's not obviously a conspiracy theory because Donald Trump opened his big mouth and said, we're there to take the oil. So that is not reported on the BBC. Uh, the BBC will tell you that we're on the side of the Syrian people, and yet we're actually keeping quiet about the fact that America occupies a third of Syria and is trying to starve the people because they couldn't beat them by bombing them. So, the, and, and of course, you know, it, it's if, we can, if, we can, to, if we can bring it back, sorry, if we can bring it back to just to, yeah. to Labour and, and yeah. focus on, I mean, obviously, you know, in terms of the BBC, have been identified very clearly as being culpable in the the lack of success that Jeremy Corbyn had uh, yeah. both in 2017 and 2019 but the, you know the wider media as well uh, okay so so if I'm talking about stories that don't get covered obviously the leaked labor report you know people were getting suspended investigated expelled in in a lot of cases they were not even told you know what they were being charged with and some people were simply being dumped uh, in suspension, and some people have been waiting three or four years for the party to deal with it. Now, the leaked Labour report actually gave us smoking gun evidence to say that the party at the top was rife with corruption. And obviously, there were people there getting paid membership fees, you know, as a wage, who wanted us to lose the general election. And the BBC had nothing to say about that. They've got, they've got the evidence there, hard evidence, saying that what, you, what they were reporting is actually the opposite of what was happening. And of course, they had plenty to say about anyone who wanted to accuse anyone in the Labour Party of anti-Semitism. The BBC is an utterly corrupt organisation. We like their news, uh, their, we like their, documentaries we, the children like the children's programs we all grow up with them but the news output is diabolical and it, it, it's it's just lies of omission all the time they could if, if corbyn had been going around covid wards at the start of the pandemic shaking their hands and then saying i've been shaking hands with covid patients today if that had been jeremy corbyn he would have been hounded out of office they would have said is this the most stupid man in the universe or at least on this planet because the the guy boris is a buffoon we all know that much more of a buffoon than corbyn and yet the bbc want to give Boris a free pass most of the time and Corbyn he could do nothing right even though he had the support of half a million people who joined the party in order to support him and all those young people and basically the establishment screwed them over. Thank, thank you. In terms of just to finish off both of you can we just focus on 
how what major differences would you, would you say are there between Jeremy Corbyn's Labour and how he perceived moving forward and Keir Starmer? Because what we are seeing is that the the membership of the Labour Party is hemorrhaging massively. We're not talking about a capillary here. We're talking about a major artery in terms of membership of the Labour Party. And there's been so much criticism, certainly from the left, of the way in which the Labour Party is is is, is now operating. So can we just can you can we just finish off if you start off with Lizzie with just some major differences in, from your perspective of Jeremy Corbyn's Labour and Keir Starmer's Labour? Well, uh, to start it off with the ending. I will not vote Labour again. I should probably go back to not voting at all, unless uh, unless it's an independent. Um, I believe that um, Jeremy Corbyn, what he did, what he did very successfully, was awakened a political intent in everybody, in so many people, almost everybody, even if it was to hate him due to the BBC, etc., propaganda. It still awakened a political drive in so many people. And he also, what he also did was he brought all the people, the, all the members and non-members into the party. And um, he enabled independent media. And there was a, he, he was going to, if he had been successful, he was going to fund independent media so that we had a broader, a broader, uh, show a view of, yeah. of opinions and um also he was going to do, he was going to do so many things and all the people that created these plans of what he was going to do that but that supported the policies he put out um and they were all economically viable and uh indexed so all the people that created all these plans were ordinary people like you or me and we all were able, we all had office space made available to us in the House of Commons if we needed it or Labour HQ to, to finalise these plans or to draw them up and to execute them. So that stopped dead on the moment he lost the 2019 election. Um, he was removed, basically, he was removed from all aspects of the Labour Party. So now none of us in independent media uh, can speak to a member of the House of Commons, the, a member of the Labour Party. Uh, we don't know any of them. Uh, if we do speak to them, it's the ones, the, the usual ones, Jeremy Corbyn will come out, uh, but he has to be a bit careful about who, who he speaks to, you know, what platform he uses to speak. And um, John McDonnell, um, that's about it, I think. You know, I, 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 uh, Clive Lewis, perhaps a, a little bit. Clive Lewis and Richard Bergen speaks out, but he doesn't tend to come out onto anybody's platform and speak like you can't invite him onto your show um but so what starmer did was he's closed down um he's closed down all public involvement and he's returned it to the corrupt arms of the establishment the arms industry the private health industry uh the israel lobby um and i, I i'm sure there are there are other well, the corrupt media uh, moguls. There are other people that he's now in bed with, but it's definitely not with the people of this country and it's definitely not with the members of the Labour Party. All right, thanks, Lizzie. Damien, is, is there anything to add to that? And, and there's something else as well I'm, I'm, It concerns me is that where we have the, the idea of Jeremy Corbyn liberating the Labour Party and, and democratising it, it strikes me that what Keir Starmer has done is largely the opposite. And his, his apparatchik behind him are very much supportive of un, sort of undemocratising, if, if, if you follow me, the, the Labour Party. 
Um, so is, is that something that you've noticed and concerns you, just to well, finish off? I mean, certainly Corbyn will stop from democratising the party. And if anything, I think we're going to go backwards. You know, there will not be more democracy in the party. And, and as to the future, you know, whether I agree with enough Labour policies for vote, to, to vote for them again, um, looking at it, I doubt it. But, but to trump all of that is I made a complaint um, in 2018 which the party has still never, uh, they've, ne they've still never dealt with it. So every time I get a message from the Labour Party now, I simply write back and say, I'm doing nothing for you. I'm not going to be an activist. I'm not going to deliver a leaflet. I'm going to do zero until you deal with my complaint from 2018. Um, I, I actually wrote to David Evans because the EHRC said legally the Labour Party now needs to run a, a proper complaints uh, system. I sent two letters to David Evans saying, I've got a complaint sat in your inbox from 2018, which still hasn't been dealt with. And he ignored both of those letters. So I've gone back to the EHRC to say that the Labour Party is still running a, a complaint system which discriminates between those who, who are Corbynites and those who aren't. Because the only reason they're not dealing with my complaint is that the party, when when I had some um, correspondence with them, accidentally uh, sent me material that they, they failed to redact. So I found out about some of the corruption that was going on up, up at HQ. And so my complaint was about, what are you going to do about this corruption? And that's why they're not releasing the Ford report. That's why they're not dealing with my complaint because when you have evidence and you, you try to use the complaint system, you, they literally ignore you unless, of course, you're on the other side and they want to expel you. So, so you know, I'm not going to vote Labour in future simply at the moment because they have not dealt with my complaint. They are not treating members with respect and dignity. If I had enough money, I would sue the party and I would win hands down. I've already been to the police about this corruption. And the only people who aren't interested in it, because I do have a police crime number, the only people not interested in it is the Labour Party. And if the Labour Party is watching this, my case is CN2172, and it's been sat in your inbox for nearly four years, and not even a direct letter to David Evans has managed to get my complaint even looked at. So... You know, disillusioned, yes, I would love to leave the party, but because I've got this ongoing complaint, I can't leave the party because it will give them an excuse not to have to deal with it. So, so that's where I am. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Lizzie. Thank you so much, Damien, for coming on the show. It, it, it seems to me that, that the Labour Party has a, a, a rod almost going down straight down through it at the moment and you've got those on the left who are very much saying we're not going to vote for you again until you you know conform to our perception of what the Labour Party should look like but then you've got another group and all they want to say is oh well, if you don't vote for the Labour Party you're just going to keep the Conservative Party in forever um, and I guess what the left then respond with is well if you get the current Labour administration in to replace the Labour replace the Conservative Party, you are in effect keeping the Conservative Party in forever, just like we were with Blair. So Yeah, there's no difference between the two. It's a horrible model, no it's difference. a horrible mess. And I think it also comes back, just to sum up, the way you both discussed the idea, especially you, Lizzie, talked about the, the voting system. Because the vote, and, and sorry, and so did, so did you, Damien, that the voting system in that our votes don't count. Um, until we change the voting system radically, when all of our votes count, mm -hmm. we're just left with the, the, what we have, aren't we? Two establishment parties who will go on yeah. probably for forever. And the and fact that Jeremy Corbyn couldn't change that in four and a, four and a bit years of leadership um, position just tells you all you need to know about how much control he had of the party mechanism. He never had any control of the party mechanism. He was always um, fighting the same as us. It's just that he was leading that fight with all of us. And now we haven't even got a leader. But grassroots activism is where it's at, people. 
you know, go on the protests, go on the demos, share everybody's posts, Dorset Eye posts, Unity News posts, Definitely. all independent media posts, share the hell out of them and let's get uh, let's get people told the truth. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Rofi, for coming on the show. Thank you. Bye-bye. Right. Thanks, Jason. Bye, Lizzie.